All right, so this is going to be Unit 1, Part 2, American History 131. Um, I, I was just talking about the evolution of man, the transition of man from the old world to the new world. Uh, not, not as in old world Europe, but as in starting from Africa. Uh, we start with Paleolithic man, and eventually we're going to get to Neolithic man. We're going to start with Homo habilis. We're going to get to Homo sapiens. We're going to get to Homo sapiens sapiens. We're going to go ahead and follow the edges of the thaw because we're leaving the ice age. We're going to transition following the food source again um, across uh, Beringia, and we're going to end up in North America. Uh, how do we know this? Well, we can trace most of the roots. And as, as far as North American ancestry goes, one of the lucky things we found is something called Clovis culture. And Clovis culture um, gives us not a genetic tracing point, but an archaeological and anthropological Logical, pardon me, uh, tracing point. What we find in, in Clovis is we find a certain spear point, a certain arrow point, certain techniques for manufacturing stone tools that, that are resident in this culture and other traits that we can follow this same culture. What's important is this is we look at a common unit of man, we look at a common transition of man that we can follow. We end up here in Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica, Middle America, because there is North, Central, and South America. When we thaw out um, first mankind, if he's going to settle in, he's going to settle in in Central America. Why? Well, because we have this very temperate, very mild zone that is thawed out first. We have really long growing seasons, and so that is going to be Central America. That's where we get some of our, our oldest civilizations in North America. Uh, the book does talk about some of it. It talks about the Olmecs. It talks about the Toltecs. It talks about the Maya. It talks about the Inca. It talks about the Aztecs. It talks about several cultures that sprout up in this area that share quite a bit of history, uh, share quite a bit of culture, share quite a bit of, well, food sources. One of the things that comes up is maize. And maize is kind of interesting because it's a modification of corn. Um, what's important is we're going to get empires. We're going to get evolution here. We're going to get a settled culture here. And then what we're going to also look at is other cultures. What we hear most about is we hear about, oh, it's the Aztecs. It's the Maya. Is they were fined. Do you realize that, that Mexico City, which was Tenochtitlan, uh, which was the, the heart of the Aztec Empire, is not the only place we have North American or Native American culture? Uh, if you look around the Southwest, if you look around the Northwest, if you look in places like, oh, uh, the Mississippi River Delta. If you follow the Mississippi, you follow the Missouri up, if you follow the Mississippi up to uh, current areas uh, around um, uh, the arch around St. Louis, what you'll find is you will find something called Cahokia. And Cahokia is a mound-building civilization of the Mississippi Indians. And Cahokia was actually the largest city in North America in the time period before Columbus ever showed up. And it's a huge mound-building city. Um, the largest earthen mound is as big as the largest pyramid in Egypt. They built these mounds so they would have raised living areas because it flooded every year, and this kept them out of the floodplain itself. What's really unique about Cahokia is they're going to get culture. They're going to get civilization. If you think about building up enough packed earth to create a living mound, a mound big enough to live on that's as big as the largest of the Great Pyramids in Egypt, that tells you an awful lot about the people. Okay. This must be a pretty strong king, a pretty strong organization. If you can command your subjects to bucket by bucket build a pyramid of earth that big, that means you can command them, you can enforce them, you can feed them, and you have a pretty strong culture. What we have is this. We have quite a few different cultures. We've got patriarchal cultures, matriarchal cultures. We've got small groups. We've got large groups. We've got uh, governmental structures. We've got trade. They find trade artifacts, <coughs> excuse me, trade artifacts um, from Aztec civilization 
all the way up in Cahokia. They find remnants of the Cahokian people, the Mississippian culture, down in the Aztec area. So there's a thriving trade. Um, all this before Columbus shows up. And you ask yourself, well, Mr. Whitley, why are you going into this at this particular point? And i got to tell you, because we want you to know. I want you to know that there's an established set of people here. There are several different cultures here before Columbus shows up. Now, here's the issue. we got to figure out why Columbus bothers to come here, because it's a little bit out of his neighborhood. And here's what we're looking at. Um, you you've got to go to Europe for this. You've got to realize that what happens in Europe is significant. Way back one, prior to 1400, um, for those of you who don't know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Why? Well, what was happening before that? Well, if you go back to 1,000, if you go back to 1,100, 1,200, what you're going to look at is somewhere between 400 to, uh, you know, 1,000. You're going to see the fall of Rome. And with the fall of Rome, you're going to see the loss of a lot of civilization. You're going to see a lot of a uh, loss of central authority. You're going to see a lot of stuff going on. And the stuff going on is going to be unrest. The stuff going on is going to be a lot of struggle for survival. And out of the struggle for survival, you're going to see what becomes a feudal system. You're going to see the rise of kings. You're going to see the rise of um, kingdoms themselves because these kings can recruit lords. They can recruit an army. They can establish their domain and their territory to create a kingdom. And they can use this feudal system, these pledges of fealty, to enforce their will upon the people, but also to protect the people. All right? And so what happens is we see the blossoming of this culture. Part of the blossoming in this culture is two things. We're going to see throughout the blossoming of this culture, we're going to see... Um, one constant. And that constant is going to be the Catholic Church. Not the Christian Church, but the Catholic Church, because at this point, the Christian Church is the Catholic Church. And what you're going to see is you're going to see the growth of large kingdoms. Um, part of that is going to be Charlemagne. Part of that is going to be a few other folks along the way. I'm not going to worry about those, because that's World Tiff too. But what we are going to see is this. You're going to see um, a rebirth of civilization. And this rebirth of civilization is kind of important because what will happen is this. Um, this rebirth of civilization, the, the strength of the Catholic Church, is going to result in something called the Crusades. And the Crusades are a historical tipping point, folks. Historical tipping point because we trade more, we travel more. Because we trade and travel more, what's going to happen is we're going to have some interesting things introduced. One of the interesting things introduced is going to be something called the plague, right? Not COVID, folks. No, wrong plague. But the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, is what's going to happen is the Italians, when they are trading, and they're going to be trading in the Orient, are going to run into a group of folks called the Mongols. And the Mongols are using biological warfare. One of the things they love to do, besides be terrifying, is they love to gather rats. The rats are known to gather fleas and gather plague, and they will drive this herd of rats in front of them into the cities, and then the people will lock themselves away from, um, not from each other, but from the Mongols. So lock the city gates and say, okay, wait, we'll, we'll camp here until they go away. But the problem is the rats will get in and infest the people and infest the plague and it will kill them off. Well, when the Venetians see that the Mongols are attacking, they're going to say, oh my gosh, it's the plague. Oh my gosh, it's the Mongols. Quick, everybody hop on the boat and we'll leave. And they hop on the boat and they leave because people are dying. When they get back to Italy, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to discover they did not leave the plague behind them. They bought the plague with them. They bought the fleas. They bought the rats with them because of this increased trade. Well, the Europeans don't have a resistance to the uh, to the disease. They, they don't have resistance to the biological warfare. And so what's going to happen is you're going to wipe out and anywhere mildly a third to two thirds of the population to parts of Europe. This changes everything. Yeah, frame it frame it in now, folks. Frame it in now. I'm not saying we're talking fleas on rats with COVID, but what we're saying is this changes everything because prior to this time, okay, prior to this time, there was an abundance of laborers. There was a shortage of work. There's a shortage of food. Uh, and suddenly, whew, 
<coughs> we flip the script. Suddenly, there's a shortage of labor, an abundance of food, an abundance of work, and so that's going to change. All right, I'm going to leave you here, and I'm going to pick up with the last piece of this. Now, remember, these are optional lectures, but sometimes they're helpful.